Welcome to Timeline Iran podcast. My name is Babak Kalhor. This is our inaugural program where we're going to be discussing Iran in various formats, in live interviews, in recorded interviews. Today, we have two special guests here, two special ladies who have spent their lives working for their vision of a better Iran. It just so happens to be that their visions are diametrically opposed. But I think we are going to have a really interesting conversation about the political landscape of Iran today and in the last century. We have uh, Fariba Amini here and Roxana Ganji. Uh, Roxana has been a political activist and a diehard monarchist her whole life. Uh, but especially after the revolution, her father, Dr. Ganji, uh, was a prominent politician in Iran in the Shah's government, held various positions. And she uh, has been a, a adamant supporter of monarchy and that cause in Iran uh, for the past 42 years. On this side, we have Fariba Amini. She's a daughter uh, of Mr. Amini, who was a very prominent po politician and uh, personal lawyer to Dr. Mossadegh. He was also the mayor of Tehran at the time of the 1953 incidents. And she comes from a different perspective on Iran. We'd like to get her opinion on uh, certain subjects that may be a little bit heated tonight, but uh, we're looking forward to having a discussion about our differences. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start off with something more general. You guys have both been fighting your whole lives for, for change in Iran, for, for a better future in Iran. With the way things are going, are you still hopeful that that's possible? We'll start with Fariba. I have to say that uh, I'm always a hopeful person when it comes to everything and anything. And especially if you look at the last few years, especially after the Mahsa movement, I am extremely hopeful that Iran is going through changes that will change the uh, whole of Iran, its society, and the future that it wants to embrace, which is a society that wants peace, um, the rule of law, democracy, and whatever that we all believe in and share in. Last time I was in Iran was 2019. And what I saw in that society with all its issues, problems, corruption, etc., you saw that people were living their lives and in each field, in each place that they worked in, uh, in with all the obstacles that are there in our society, in our Iran Iranian society, they were still able to uh, function and do whatever that they could to try to make changes that would be better for the whole nation. And I do, I do have a lot of hope. I am very optimistic that the future will bring about some kind of democratic rules, democratic laws that we have been missing for the last, not just the last 44 years of the creation of the Islamic Republic since the revolution, but also even before that, where we have never really experienced democracy in any form or shape, except in my opinion, maybe during the, la the two years that Dr. Mossadegh's government was in place. At the same time, I have to say that we are now in a in maybe in a standstill the movement is or the especially the women's movement which has been at the forefront of this movement for change uh, may be silent at the moment but at the same time i think that uh, what women have shown with their sacrifices with uh, even living under terrible conditions when it comes to the situation of women, at least I have hope and I think that most people who are active in Iran, inside Iran, are also looking for a better future. And I think that they are struggling for that. And I think that they will accomplish what they want to accomplish. Roxanne? Well, thank you for having me. I've actually missed talking to you uh, politically. Yeah. 
Uh, it's been a while. It, it's been a while since the radio, and I've really missed that. I am very hopeful, and uh, I truly believe that the movement inside Iran is what they ha- what counts. You know, it, it, today they're the ones who made the difference. They're the ones who took everything in their hands. This new generation. I mean, we had the green movement. We had the movement of Kuyid on during Khatami's time. Then we had the green movement. It's all baby steps. Then we had Alban, you know, in October where 1,500 people were killed in one one day, mostly young people. And then we had the Maswa movement that was brought us, you know, to the to the brinks of getting rid of this regime. And unfortunately. Things happen that it's slowed down. I really believe that it's still in the process. It's the revolution still going on inside Iran. And as Fariba said, the women are amazing and have been since the get-go. I mean, the, this regime would have put them under Chador for good. They fought it throughout this past 44, 45 years. Women have been at the forefront of every, every change for the women's movement. And for all movements, they've been in the forefront. And this time, they really took the helm and they've been, you know, they, right there in front of everybody. And uh, But it's, it's an Iranian movement, I believe. I believe it's inclusive of everybody and this new generation, very brave, amazing generation, that I, I talk to a lot, to some of them, you know, they're adamant about getting rid of this regime. They're against everything this regime stands for right now, against Islam, against you know the way that they try to make them say death to America, death to Israel and all that. They're not, they're not following what the regime wanted anymore. The women, they took off the scarves and, the scarves and they're just very, very adamant about keeping them off, no matter what. I hear now they're, they're you know, giving them huge tickets. They're, uh, you know, they're capturing the cars at night when they're at home even. You know, they take pictures of them. They come confiscate the cars and everything. It doesn't matter. They're willing to pay the price, but they're not willing to go back to what the regime wants them to be. I'm very hopeful. I'm more hopeful, uh, you know, towards the people in Iran and what they're doing than the opposition outside. I don't have much, much hope in the opposition, truthfully. But I think there's a lot being done inside of Iran that we we don't know, and it's just the beginning. And they're taking baby steps. It was a rough, rough few months. You know, we had a lot of kids that were killed, a lot of people that were imprisoned. We had a lot of people lose their eyes, limbs, you know. But they've, they're willing to take the chance. They're willing to give up their lives. That says a lot. They really want to change. I'm in agreement with you both that whatever change takes place, it has to start from within Iran. Yet the opposition outside the expat opposition movement is very important. And I see a complete disconnect uh, within the expat opposition movements, particularly in the U.S., Los Angeles, you know, Washington. Why can't we come to a realization that our, our differences are really keeping the status quo going? Fariba? In my opinion, it's because uh, the opposition has been away from the realities of Iran for 44 years a lot of the opposition members have not even been in Iran, have not seen what's all the changes have ta- that have taken place in Iran. So in a way, they're not really connected to the society that has gone through these changes. And I have to say this, and maybe the audience may not like to hear what I say, but you know, Iran, as I always tell people, American friends, Iranians, Iran is not black and white at all. And only you can realize that once you go inside the country and you see the changes. For example, yes, women have been suppressed, oppressed. At the same time, these same women have many jobs. They're engineers, doctors, uh, lawyers, even taxi drivers. I sat in a taxi cab that was driven by a woman. Where do you see that in the Middle East? Anywhere in the Middle East. So the opposition has no real connection with the society. They still live in the past, which is 44 years ago since the revolution. And if you're not in touch with your society, you cannot determine what's good for that society. Yes, all of us want drastic and dramatic changes 
But at the same time, we have to be realistic. Do we really want another revolution without having a viable alternative to it? I don't, I don't want to, and I don't prescribe that. And I think, as Roxana said rightfully, that the change has to come from within. We cannot sit here and prescribe things for no, no, Iranians. Ag- acknowledge, acknowledge me on that, and please just explain to the, me this. Sure, the change must come from within, but why is it that the opposition cannot come to an agreement here? The differences that we have between left, religion, monarchy, those are going to exist within Iran. And I see a lot of people looking outside and looking at us, looking at us living here and saying, you guys can't even come to any agreement. What is there any, any hope for these ideas uh, living under one roof under a democracy in Iran? And that's kind of what I'm pertaining to. Why do you think we're having such a difficult time? Of course, you know, that, that's the nature of democracy. It's not pretty. You look at, you know, American democracy, it's, it's not pretty or, or clean. But why is it that, you know, the opposition here cannot come to any agreement, even though they all want change within Iran? The short answer is that the opposition, of course, is not united. And un- unfortunately, we've seen that throughout our modern history, especially since the revolution. It's very fragmented and we have very opposing views. And even though we've lived in a democracy uh, such as the United States for as long as we've lived here since the revolution, we haven't learned the basic rules of democracy, which is to agree, but also disagree in a civil way, to be able to talk to each other, to have opposing views, whereas we see in this country or any other or most Western European countries, they may fight over issues, but then they get together. We, in my opinion, we as members of the opposition, Iranian opposition, we we may get together at some point, uh, like last year when this coalition was formed. But then after just a few weeks, not even not even a few months, everyone just went their way. And it was, you know, yes, they did have a, the same goal, but they couldn't even sit together and come to some kind of compromise. Because unfortunately, I don't want to say this, that uh, perhaps it's a cultural issue that we Iranians have not learned to to see the future and to to see a better future for our society we see that but we can't let go of our you know self preservations and selfishness instead of coming together and working towards one goal and that is the you know the 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 weakness of this opposition that that's a interesting comment coming from somebody who's been fighting her whole life. It, it, it's an interesting realization you've come to. Roxan, why do you think we're so split? And I know, and I know, you know, you're very adamant about your point of view, and you know, you've you've been a diehard monarchist your whole life. Why do you think that we can't come together? Why do you think that there's this divide between people that want the same change? Well, Farrakhan explained it really well, that we haven't been to Iran in 45 years, most of us. I mean, we can't go back. A lot of us can't go back. And so we're really not in touch with the people of Iran. People like me who are still in touch, I'm still not in touch. I haven't been to Iran in 46 years almost. So, I mean, there's so much that I know and there's so much I can do from outside. And that's how I started. I wanted to change for Iran from the get-go. I wanted to lobby, do the best I can. We haven't been able to come together because everybody's selfish about their own opinion. They're, everybody is only willing to sit with people who agree with them. And even though they say we're today only unity, this was Reza Pahlavi's big motto, the princes Emru Saad et Tahad. But when it came together, and I have to say it, even my own camp, our own members didn't come together as one. How do you expect people to sit with you when monarchists can't even agree to, to be together and unite? How are you going to reach out to others and want them to unite with you? We tried. We tried for a while to include everybody, 
But did we really mean it? Today, I don't think we really meant it when we said today on the unity. Because obviously, we haven't been able to get together and unite. In 44 years, we haven't been able to do this. So for me, I don't believe it anymore. We haven't been able to. 44 years is a long time. I think at the beginning of the revolution, we had a much better and stronger opposition. I mean, Dr. Bakhtiar, the late Dr. Bakhtiar, my father's organization, even though they were different in, you know, one was monarchist, my father started as a monarchist. I mean, then he realized that the monarchists all camped against him. So he decided that he's going to go his own way, human rights, freedom and democracy for Iran, and not let that affect the organization. And maybe that was one reason they were successful enough that the regime came and terrorized, you know, killed about four of their members, four or five of their members outside of Iran. And when Clinton came to power, the, one of the big things for the Islamic Republic was to stop the funding for Derav Shekhov Yani. My father and Dr. Bakhtiar worked really closely together, I mean, on issues. I mean, uh, they talked to each other. They had meetings with each other. When my father found out there's terrorists coming out, he would call Dr. Bakhtiar's office and say, hey, beware, they just get, the French just told me. So they, they had a, a dialogue going on. After a while, this dialogue stopped. And it was all, everybody's after their own agenda. This can't work when we're after our own agenda. We have to come together. We have one enemy, and that's the Islamic Republic. And like Farber said, I just don't want to have a change just to have a change. That's the big mistake they did during the Shah in 1979. They said the Shah has to go. It doesn't matter who comes to power. Look where we are today. I don't want that to happen for Iran again. I don't. Let's take a step back into the last century. And, you know, we've had countless changes of governments, kings, dynasties. We've had five revolutions, five complete changes of government in the last century, in the, in the 20th century. Why do you think 1953 and Mossadegh is still so important and vibrant in our, in our political consciousness in Iranians that we still are at this impasse over this one prime minister in, in hundreds. Uh, we've even had changes of kings and changes of monarchies, which hasn't created such a little sticking point for us. Faiwa, you tell me that. You, you tell me why do you think the memory of Dr. Mossadegh and the 1953 is different than Razmara or Qavam or uh, any of the other prime ministers that have come and gone? To be very frank, you know, I was born and raised in a family uh, who was very political. And uh, I remember when I was a child, we had radio uh, at all. You know, I was very, very young. I don't know, probably in my teens. So I was raised in a family that, you know, we listened to different radio stations. And I didn't know at that time who Mossadegh was. I just knew that, well, he was my father's hero. And then little by little after growing up and then coming to the U.S., I started reading more about him. It wasn't just because my father's, he was my father's hero, but the more I read about him, this man who uh, he represented, what he wanted for Iran, I came to even uh, admire him more. And one of the things that I've always talked about in my writings, even with an interview I did with you two years ago about Mossadegh, it's not like, uh, you know, a any politician, every politician may have flaws, may have made mistakes and all that. But one thing about Mossadegh which really highlights his tenure and his, his being is, or what he did for Iran was, he was one of the very rare politicians who was incorruptible. In my opinion, that is the major major attribute of Dr. Mossadegh, that no one could buy him. No one could tell him, well, you should do this, you should give money, uh, you should uh, give bribes to individuals, to the clergy. Uh, you know, I would like to quote from my father's memoir, which was one of the longest interviews that the late uh, Dr. Habib el did it with Harvard Oral History. 16 tapes. And in one of those tapes, uh, and I always like to mention this, is Kashani, 
آیت الله کاشانی my, my father was a liaison between کاشانی and مصدق because they used to say that uh, Mr. Amini you are a آخوند باز uh, but it's funny because uh, and I think that I uh, take this uh, you know, a wonderful character of my father, not as good as him, but that I like to, you know, sit and 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 talk to other people from different points of view, monarchists, leftists, uh, you know, socialists, Democrats, from all different points of view. And this was also my father. My father had many, many monarchist friends. I mean, Daryusha Homayun used to come to Washington. The first place he would come to was my father's house. And he had, you know, very civil relationship with all these people. And one of the things that in this memoir, uh, he goes to Kashani and says, Ayatollah Kashani, Dr. Mossadegh, you know, wants to work with you. And Kashani replies, well, tell him that he has to appoint my son, who was at that time 20 years old, his youngest son, to become a member of the Majlis. And uh, my father takes the message back to Mossadegh. And Mossadegh says, well, tell Mr. Kashani that I am not the one who can appoint member of, of the Majlis or the parliament. It's the people of that city or the a town that should appoint him. And unfortunately, from all accounts, the young man was kind of corrupt and he was well known in the city or in the town that they lived. And when my father takes the message back to Kashani, Kashani says, well, tell him that if he doesn't do that, if he does not appoint my son, I'm going to bring him down. And he uses actually a very foul language. Unfortunately, he did have very foul language which I'm not going to repeat in this uh, interview. But what I'm trying to, to, to tell you is that uh, Mossadegh believed in the rule of law, in democracy. He believed in the Jeffersonian, he was in the Jeffersonian mode of thinking that we, we can have a democracy even in Iran, which has not experienced that. And um, he, uh, Whenever they brought him gifts, uh, this is another very interesting episode. He would tell, um, he wouldn't reject the gift uh, because it was not polite, but he would tell the person, the next person who comes to the door, give that gift to that person. So he was against bribing people. He was against, you know, giving any kind of uh, favors, even, even when they named they wanted to name a, a street in his name while he was the prime minister a lady comes to to the office of the prime minister and says they're going to uh, uh, demolish my my house because they want to name this street in in your name and he says he orders my father who was the mayor at the time please go and do whatever you can mm, to stop this because i don't want any uh, uh, any street in my name when they're going to demolish the the person's property so he he was uh, he was a man who uh, believed in integrity he was honest to the bone and maybe that was one of his detriments that he in in a society like Iran where corruption has been always had been always rampant he was the only one and he's uh, the people around him the people around him people who were members of the national front including my father they were all of the highest integrity they all wanted to uh, work for the betterment of their society and i have to add this that also many in the shah's entourage many in the shah's entourage were also of the same caliber and I say this really, uh, you know, uh, I believe in it because I've uh, seen them, I've known some, I've read about them, and a lot of them came, you know, after the revolution. There are many members of the military, members of the very higher, you know, high class of Iran. They used to drive taxi cabs in Washington, D.C. They didn't come 
with millions of dollars as some did, but most of them were honest men, honest women with integrity. So you think it's his honesty and incorruptibility that's uh, kind of kept his legend? Do you think that's, that's the main factor that, that's uh, resonated with your audience? Yes, and also that, well, when it, comes, when it came to the nationalization of oil, he uh, put everything aside uh, and he said that I have to go and defend my nation against two superpowers. One, a declining superpower, the British, the British uh, government, and the upcoming superpower, America. At that time, of course, it was the British mainly because they were the ones who were the, against the nationalization. The, the Americans were not for it uh, at all at the beginning, and they wanted to cooperate with Mossadegh. That's why Mossadegh, uh, Dr. Mossadegh trusted the Americans that they would stand by him because he was the one who really believed in, in democracy or democratic rules. I think that his defense of the Iranian nation vis-a-vis -vis two imperial powers showed to Iranians that this is a man who's standing beside us. Roxanne, I've interviewed a lot of monarchists, you know that, and, and I've heard a lot of the the opposite side. Uh, Mossadegh was dismissed just like any other prime minister legally by the Shah within the Shah's const constitutional rights as a monarch. Also that Mossadegh was not the only democratically elected prime minister. Yet, while these facts may hold true, why has Mossadegh's legacy haunted our political unity as a country for such a long time? Why is, why is this one incident so different? Well, uh my father was pro Mossadegh when he was younger, and he was in Geneva doing his doctorate and postdoc and everything. And uh, because of the nationalization of oil and everything, and he was away from Iran for a long time, my father. He used to go for the summer sometimes, but uh, he was away, and he was very much pro Mossadegh at that time. When he went, went back to Iran, because uh, after he married my mom, my mom was on the other spectrum. Uh, her whole family, Hassan Ali Mansour, was her cousin. And so he married into a family who was from the other side of the spectrum, who were like pro-monarchy, and uh, one was prime minister. Previously, her Hassan Ali's father was the prime minister. So he got to know the two sides of the, the coin. And uh, he, truthfully, I, well, I personally believe Dr. Mossadegh was a true patriot. He, he really wanted the best for Iran. And I really, really... You know, I admire the Shah of Iran. They're, I think they were both two patriots. The thing that I think caused this whole division was the 1953 coup, uprising, whatever they want to call it, caused the division between these two men. I, I mean, and I mean, before the, the whole thing happened, the division between these two men, who all wanted the best for Iran in their own way, brought a division in the nation and in the people. We were divided then after that. And this has this is what's stuck in everybody's. If you're a diehard monarchist, you blame Mossadegh. If you're pro Mossadegh, you blame the the monarchists for what happened in Iran. So it's no use for, as far as my opinion, it's no use for us to argue. One can't convince the other side. Each one has their own opinion. We have to agree that this is a subject as important as it is. First of all, unfortunately. We've never had a democratically elected prime minister. The Shah always elected the prime ministers. In some cases, like my father, the Shah sometimes insisted that the ministers stay on. When the, my father was Hoveido's minister of education, but he started doing a lot for the you know the teachers. He started doubling the salaries. He was in the process of making a bank for the teachers and everything. So he was in the process of doing things. When Almuzegar came to power, he didn't want my father, as he was going to introduce somebody else as Minister of Education. The Shah insisted that Ganji has started this process that needs to continue. Somebody else might not know what's going on, so he kept my father. Same thing when Shadi Femmon came. The Shah insisted my father stay on as Minister of Education. My father resigned because 
during the revolution, during the uprisings, whatever that, that was happening, there was a list that was given out of all the ministers of the Shah that they took money out of Iran. And my father heard this on the, and somebody called him from Majlis saying, they just accused you of transferring $36 million out of Iran. So he rushed to the Majlis and he told Sharif Imami, I want to go and defend myself because this is going live on TV. Sharif Imami wouldn't let him do that. So my father insisted that if you don't let me go defend myself right now, if the, you know, I can't do it in the parliament, I'm going to get up from right here and I'm going to speak. And then he resigned. So he, the Shah kept my father for two prime ministers who didn't want him. So this was not a pro democratically, unfortunately, that's not a good thing. I'm not defending it. But we've never, because I've had this argument a lot with people who are supporters of Mossad that they keep saying democratically elected. We've never, unfortunately, had a democratically elected prime minister. But he was Iran. probably the most popular that he was had. the most popular, but he wasn't elected. He yeah. was elected by the Shah. People didn't vote for him. I mean, the Majlis eventually voted him in, but... You know that if the Shah didn't want him in there, they, they wouldn't keep him. Unfortunately, back then, the Shah had the power through the Constitution to, to sub, you know, introduce a prime minister, remove a prime minister. So a lot of that conflict came from, you know, a lot of this conflict is because of the rift between the Shah and Mossadegh. And that's what's kept, you know, in people's mind that, okay, the Shah removed Mossadegh from power, and a lot of people say, well, Mossadegh caused this. No two, part, no two sides are going to agree, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And this is where we are stuck after all these years. We have to learn, to, like Fariba said, to agree to disagree. Let's agree to disagree. But we have lost our country. Today, Iran is a hostage to a bunch of non-Iranians. This whole group is non-Iranian as far as I'm concerned. They don't care anything about Iran. They go against the values of Mossadegh, they go against the values of the Shah, because both men wanted the best for Iran, and these guys don't. So we have one common enemy. Let's concentrate on that. If we cannot today, where our country has come so far, in, in, we're in deep doo-doo right now, unfortunately. Everything's gone from the environment to the, to the um, education system, to human rights, to everything. There's so much corruption going on. If we cannot, for the sake of the future generation, put our differences aside and come together to fight one common enemy for the love of Iran, there's only one Iran, and we all belong to that Iran. It doesn't matter if you're a leftist, a monarchist, a Mossadegh, you're, we're all Iranian. Whoever's heart beats for the freedom of Iran, we have to learn to come together, not only today to topple these, these people, but in the future of Iran, we have to be able to agree to disagree, but build our country and move on. Otherwise, we're going to keep having these revolutions, unfortunately. I don't know if we've come that far yet. If I may say, uh, uh, if you allow me to kind of respond to what Roxana just said. Sure. Uh, it's important for Iranians, uh, all of us, to read our history really, really well. To look at when we when we speak, to go back to documents, to our to whatever that has been written uh, in our history, and not just from one side, but from all sides. Especially if we read academic works, because the academics have done tremendous research on the subject of Mossadegh, the Shah, the revolution, the coup d'etat, and all that. Still, you know, to this day, we find a lot of monarchies who say there was no CIA coup d'etat when, when the CIA, uh, not MI6, but the CIA even has admitted that there was a coup, that we actually uh, paid money to various elements within Iranian society, whether the clergy or pro-Shah uh, people. And, you know, to deny this is like you're denying our history. So first, uh, I, you know, I prescribe to all the people who still want to, who, who still believe that this was not a coup, but it was an uprising, I would highly recommend that they really go read some more and read the facts, look at the facts. Whether the, the Mossadegh was democratically elected or not, I think that's something that it's always used by the other side. 
uh, if we go back to the constitution, to the constitutional revolution and to our constitution of 1906, the Shah was supposed to be a monarch, but not govern, which is also the case with uh, uh, Great Britain, with all the Western European countries who still have monarchies like Holland, uh, like other places, who is the the king to appoint or dismiss? A, a, but a, he had that a, constitutional right at the nineteen fifty-three. But it was the forty-sixth article. It, it did, was yeah. also the parliament who should have made the decision to. But the parliament was disbanded. The the parliament was half of the parliament were paid. Yeah, were paid agents. I'm sorry, paid by the British, not the Americans. So how can Mossadegh? been able to even do anything when half the, half the parliament, half the majlis is, a, is are paid agents. So, you know, that's another issue. You know, we can talk about these, you know. I don't think we're ever going to be able to agree on these fine points. And I'm not saying that this was the right thing that, they, that was going on, but that's the way it was. Unfortunately, the Shah had the power of electing a, a, a prime minister and are you know dismissing a prime minister or even the parliament you know uh, it's not a good thing i'm not defending that but that's the way it was done back then and and, uh, it, let, and me, let me just interject one thing again we're not going to agree on this point but let's move past this because you said academia has has kind of filled in all the blanks i don't think academia has filled in all the blanks in 1953 one thing that's missing and, and I agree, it, w it was an operation of CIA and MI6. But you know I've talked to a lot of people that you've introduced me to, and, and a lot of academics have pointed to the role that the clergy played because the CIA MI6 fa coup failed. What came into this, the, the, the change the equation, was Ayatollah Kashani mm -hmm. and the Islamic forces coming in, the demonstrations, uh, the crowds, uh, that tilted this movement, this coup, this ouster, whatever you, you want to name it. Why is there so little information about the role of the clergy in 1953, ouster of Mossadegh? I say this, and, and, I, and I've talked about this, you both know, and one of the things that's kind of taken us on this trajectory, this tangent, has been Madeleine Albright coming and apologizing for America's role in the ouster of Mossadegh. Thanks which I think, which, well, well, <laughs> which, which is, I think it's due because we did have a role in that. We, we did want Mossadegh out. We did kind of get ourselves involved in that. Yet, Secretary Albright apologized to the same people that ousted Mossadegh. It created a kind of a confusion uh, within, within ourselves. And, you know, I've seen certain people talk about this, uh, Professor Bayandor, a lot of people talk about this issue. But very few people in academia uh, discuss that. Recently, there's certain things that have been coming out with the freedom of information, and we're seeing, mm -hmm. you know, the the, the money's paid, the support that was given to that. But why do you think there's no discussion of that? Financial? The role of the Russians in all of it, and the fear. Well, let, let's let's yeah. let's talk about let's talk about the clergy. Let's ask you why do you think there's so little? I'll come back to you on that. I don't want to throw everything on you on this, but why do you think there's there's so little discussion about that? And we as a country we don't discuss that we don't know about that or people don't discuss that either well first of all a lot of the academics are pro Mossad I mean they come from that generation you know and I've seen this in a lot of universities that we go to and everything I don't know I what am I going to tell you I from what I see is that you know a lot of people are one-sided about this. They're just not willing to see both sides of the coin. They see mostly the Mossad, especially the academia. They see the Mossad side of the point, but they don't see this side of the but point. But it's not the Mossad or the Shah point. Well, but it, the, it's something, something but the, completely different. The other different. thing is the, they don't, the fear of the Russians and the Tudor party and all they were doing back then, this is silent. I mean, now it's coming out with these CIA documents that came out about how Ajax got started and all that stuff, there's slowly trickling down information that's coming out. And Dr. Mossadegh, uh, you know, at one point, I've read this, this is, I, I, I'm not sure about this, but I've read, I've heard this, that um, they, the family of Mossadegh gave the, his private letters and everything to Hosseini K. Ostovan. And there was one letter to the Russians seven, eight years before 19, 1953, or I think 1944 or 1945, that Mossadegh wrote to the Russians about uh, praising the Red Army and all that. So 
this all being put together is brings the fear, even though we know Dr. Mossadegh was a patriot. But back then, maybe the situation was different that he had to deal with the Russians somehow. I don't know the details of that. This is all coming out. But maybe the, it, was, it's the, it was the fear of that that caused the Americans and the British to get together and decide, okay, what are we going to do? Let the Russians step in and take Iran? Or are we going to step in and bring, you know, let support the Shah? And I think that's what happened, that they really decided to support the Shah. And again, that that's let's go back. I understand we, we know we don't want to go back to the things that that we've you're saying. Discussed. Why there, I want to say why is the there's no discussion of the clergy having a role in ousting Mossadegh? Maybe you can answer that as as a supporter of Mossadegh, and you know what happened that he was ousted. We talked to Mr. Hedo Matin Dafter. He he told me who those those thugs were in the streets. They were rel religious thugs that that were outside of Mossadegh's house. There were a certain number of them, not all of them. It was it was the military, the military coup, and the CIA, and my six and Shaban Bimoch, and that whole movement. You know, it petered out for a couple of days. There was a lull. Then there was th this 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 peak again, and that peak coincided with the clergy coming in. Why is it that even Mossadegh's side, we, I hear very little discussion of that? Because uh, I think it's much more complicated than that. And one, you know, I want to first start by saying that not all academics are pro Mossadegh. Academics are supposed to be writing from a completely uh, neutral point of view. And many have, many, maybe many not, they, they, they have not. But mostly academics of high caliber, they write history as it is, as facts are shown, as documents are shown. And these people have gone through documents from the British offices, from American archives, from European archives. So they haven't, they, they, they're not necessarily, they haven't written these books just because they're pro Mossadegh. That's I. I well, let, let's get back to the question I, I asked you. Please. I yes, I, I and I will answer you because I don't think it was just the clergy. I don't think that it was just the clergy who did not support. Well, Kashani at the beginning did support Mossadegh. But I'm talking about the coup and, and, and the and, actual and involvement yes, they and were, the flipping of. The, they they were know. involved, and I do not believe that the thugs who came out. Uh, in the streets were necessarily pro uh, clergy. They were paid. They were paid by so you don't by think the Hashani money. Had any role in, by in, in the, the money, the sh uh, uh, I will I will get to that. But the money that was paid to these thugs were CIA money. The CIA gave a lot of money to different, uh, just as they have done in many other countries, in many other coup d'etats in different countries in Latin America, in other countries. They pay whoever that they can pay and they will come and do their you know bid or their their dirty you know uh involve in their dirty uh uh hand we have acknowledged and the cia role i'm talking about this but, particular part of it and i'm saying that it was in this coup d'etat it was not just the clergy and the the clergy's I, I didn't role, say it was just the it, clergy. The I said that's 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 the yes, tipping point. That's what added into the equilibrium and, the, and changed it. And the clergy's role is coming out more and more in the new documents, in the new research that's been done. But you have to also understand the clergy was not just Kashani. You have Ayatollah Zanjani. You have Ayatollah yeah, well, Talegani. Yeah. These were all supporters of Mossadegh. So clergy, you can't just say you know, the whole of clergy, you know, had a role in the coup d'etat. There were a number of people, and I want to say at the beginning, Kashani did cooperate with Mossadegh, but then later he changed his tone, tone and tune because it was more of self-interest, just as I explained about his son. Regardless of that, I just, again, I'm going to leave it at that, if, if, if you want to leave it at that, but just my question is, why don't supporters of Mossadegh acknowledge that role why haven't why is it just starting to trickle out in academia why hasn't there been more as much as information has been on the cia role and the mi6 role and the cia has written books about that we did this but n very little in there is mention of the mechanisms they used uh, which is you know paying people and sometimes paying the clergy on that too why is there why is there no mention of it I, from the Mossadegh camp? Because this is like something that would affront me. If I was a supporter of Mossadegh, uh, I would be upset at this that nobody's discussing this. 
I think because more research has been done in recent times, in the last uh, maybe 10 years, of the lo role of clergy, and I think a lot of people have talked about it, have written about it, but the, it was not just the clergy whose role was important. You know, it is coming to light now because more research has been done. Uh, you know, the, 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 because, because of the role of the CIA and MI6, and also uh, the a their agents, their, th those were much more crucial in bringing down Mossadegh than the clergy. Because the clergy, when we talk about clergy, it's a vast you know, number of people. Then where do you put Talegani, Zanjani, and all these other people? Yes, then there was Behbahani, there was uh, Kashani. Behbahani and, and Kashani, they're kind of in the same because camp. They that, were, that's, yeah. They're, yeah, because they were very pro-Shah. Yeah. They were very, very pro Shah. They, you know, they, they, I mean, Kashani has, you know, a famous saying after the coup that I'm, you know, very happy that the Shah has come back to Iran. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was self interest. Self interest. Can I ask you something, Farah Do you agree that the Americans and the British, and I, I hate for any country to interfere in our business? I, I, I really truly do. Uh, and from my own experience with my family and my father being funded by the CIA, his organization, I know they're after their own agenda and that when they need to, they pull out, you know, they, they don't support you in your cause. It's their self-interest that they're after. But do you agree that back then their fear of the Russians stepping in, which they finally did in 79, because we all know that they're running the behind the show, the Russians are running the Ayatollahs in Iran. Uh, but do you agree that that was a big threat back then, that the Russians could step in with the Tudor party, and that's why they supported the Shah to come back in fear of Mossadegh stepping in and the Russians taking advantage of this situation to come in? Uh, yes, to some extent, uh, I agree with that. But however, you have to s s uh, see that the Tudor party, there were also many members of the Tudor, the rank and file, who were very much pro Mossadegh. And yes, it, you know, we were talking about the Cold War. Mm -hmm. The Americans were scared of the left, of the red, you know, uh, the reds, you know, the Russians coming to Iran and, you know, taking over if Mossadegh were to stay in power. That's why they wanted to bring the Shah back or they wanted to keep the Shah. But Mossadegh himself, and this is not just me saying, George McGee, Ambassador George McGee, in his memoir, on, or in his book, Mid, uh, Envoy to the Middle World, he says that I had long conversation with Prime Minister Mossadegh, and I knew uh, from all the conversation I had with him and from all the documents that we in the American diplomatic corps know, know of him that he was anti-Soviet, he was anti-communism, and he had no uh, affinity with the Tudor party. In fact, in fact, in my father's memoir, there is a mention that uh, the Tudor, members of the Tudor, uh, some of the high-ranking members came to Dr. Mossadegh and told him, listen, there is a coup against you. And you have to arm us in order to stop the coup. And he says in response, let the hands of a prime minister be broken if I arm you to shed the blood of my people, of our people. So, you know, from the, the CIA, and, and uh, let's not talk about the British, but the CIA knew that Mossadegh was anti-Soviet, anti-influence of the Tudeh, and Yes, you know, the Americans at that time, in that, you know, um, in that period, they were scared of the, you know, uh, the red, or whatever they call the red influence in Iran, that maybe Mossadegh could not hold on to power and the Soviets could come and take over Iran. That is always a possibility, but, you know, we can't really... T uh, we can't really say for sure and we can't really live no, in can't. history with mm -hmm. ifs yeah. and what. Now another question, another if. If Dr. Mossadegh and the Shah were able to come together and for the sake of Iran work together and put their differences aside, do you think this revolution would have happened? Well, you know, uh, as I said before, um, you cannot live with ifs in history. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that if the Shah had 
cooperated with Mossadegh. And the main difference between Mossadegh and the Shah was Mossadegh believed that the king should be monarch and the prime minister or the, and the parliament should govern the country. And unfortunately, the Shah wanted all the power to himself, whether it, whether it came to military power or, you know, his hold on everything. And, you know, he didn't co- cooperate. He didn't cooperate with Mossadegh. And unfortunately, the, the foreign elements and the elements, you know, inside Iran, whether it was clergy or pro-British or pro-American agents, they were active. The CIA was writing, you know, um, articles in, at, in Langley. And this is, you know, according to, to all the cables that were going in and out, you know, from the Langley in, in Virginia mm-hmm. to Tehran, you know, they would write articles and it would be published in the next uh, day, uh, news dailies of, in Iran. So they were very much involved in, you know, trying to undermine the government of Mossadegh because Mossadegh, basically, in my opinion, the Americans did not want to, uh, because of his insistence on the national you know, in nationalization of oil, they did not want to have a precedent for other countries in the Middle East and other countries around the world who wanted to nationalize their their natural resources. And they wanted to, to halt this because, because of interest, because of oil interest or because of, you know, in, 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 in the case of Chile or Guatemala or other countries, they wanted to gain, to have access to the resources of those countries. You know, it's interesting you guys mentioned Russia as being the biggest fear of America, Iran closing up to Russia, and look at Russia today. <laughs> That's what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Russian history I- is deep within Iran, <laughs> and uh, w- it's not often talked about. You know, with the treaties of Golestan in 1830, uh, 1813, where we see the Dagestan, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and then Turkmenistan in 1828, where Erevan, Nakhchivan, and Talish Khanets. They've occupied Iran numerous times. They've occupied our majlis. They've bombed our majlis. They've killed our members of parliament. They've intervened in our politics in direct involvement in choosing Qajar kings for many years. We've been besieged by the Russians for a long time. Uh, our involvement with the Russians have been much long has been much longer, much more detrimental than our involvement with the US. Yet the Islamic Republic is is cozying up to them and you know allying with them in this in this axis of China Russia and Iran, and I'm wondering where is the where is our collective memory as a people? I'm not talking about you two in particular, but our people, our country, our politicians, and there's no discussion of this. I mean, uh, I was watching Lavrov, Foreign Minister Lavrov, talking about America's involvement in 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 Afghanistan, America's involvement in Vietnam, and and I'm not defending any of that, but where is the remembrance of? Russian involvement in Iran, in Rasht, in Azerbaijan, in in in, our, in many 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 parts of our history. Why have, have why have we forgotten this? I want both of you guys to comment. Whoever I don't wants think it. we've forgotten it. I think well, it's it's not there in our discussions of of Russia. Well, a lot more now. The past few years, a lot more has been talking. You know, Khamenei was a, a student at Patrice Lumumba. He was trained by them, and he's running their show for them. And they're telling you what to do. I mean, don't, there's a big, big Russian influence in Iran. It's not just nobody's talking about it. I think we everybody sees it. Uh, everybody in Iran sees it really well now that the Russians have their hand behind Khomeini. And I mean, they're supporting him on full force. So they stepped in. After the fear we had of the Russians stepping in, they, they did. And they were planning it all along. They planned it. Pretty good. It's almost like the ghost of Mossad that is haunting Iran. <laughs> you know, that same fear we had with him, uh, it's come true. Um, I, I, I was just actually, <laughs> the other day, uh, I was uh, translating uh, the interview that you conducted with Gary Sick. And it's a very interesting interview because he also talks about this. He says that 
the British, British imperialism, American imperialism is all that Iranians talk about, but they do not talk about Russian imperialism and their role in the history, at least the modern history of Iran. And why is that? And he, he doesn't really ha- answer that question, but we know that the Russians have always been interested in Iran and in, 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 you know, having their hands in, in different parts of Iran, especially nor- north of Iran, you know, the Caspian Caspi. area. <laughs> and today, yes, definitely Russia is involved very much in Iranian politics. We know that in the recent uh, war on Ukraine, uh, Iranians have uh, supported Russia, have even given drones to Russia. And uh, it's really amazing that the Russians cannot even have their own drones that Iranians have to exactly. give them. So, yeah, Russia is very much involved and has a lot of influence in Iran. With, I mean, with, uh, with the Islamic Republic. But I disagree with Roxana. And I think this is a man-made or, you know, completely a myth by some individuals that I question their credibility that uh, Khomeini, uh, Khomeini went to Patris Lumumba. There is no, absolutely no They have fact. another roster for, their, uh, for alumni. They had the celebration of their 100th year and they have him on, on their roster. There is no, there is no factual, uh, uh, there, there is no fact about this. And I totally disagree their own with roster that. is not a fact their own celebration of their 100th year i'll send it to you they I, have him as an alumni of patrice lomomba i mean i don't think they would lie about it themselves well i mean we also heard that he took a canoe and went to the yeah, other that, side that i'm not right. gonna uh, right. you know well, kind of but the, the gist of the question was our collective memory of, of what the russians have done whoever agents here and there in the shah's government in, in the islamic republic but as a people, I, and I know academia has written a lot about this. It's not like that academics have been silent about this. I've read a lot of amazing books about the role of the Russians in Iran, but it's not on the tip of our tongues when we're speaking about it. Just one point I brought up. Another another question I want to ask. I, I, I'm sorry, I, go ahead. I, sorry, I, I just want to say something. It's because, you know, in the Iranian psyche, even more than the Americans, when, when you, you look at the last hundred years, we blame everything on the British, the <laughs> British, the British. <laughs> even, <laughs> even Dr. Mossadegh, you know, he also believed that the British were, you know, much more, you know, had, had their hands in, in the politics of Iran. And it's not far-fetched, but it's because we don't read history very well. We don't really go into uh, reading about the influences of you know, other other uh, major powers. Uh, there were there were other people who were other foreigners who were involved in the Germans. What about the role of Germans in Iran during you know uh, with with Reza Shah, uh, especially with Reza Shah, not Mohammad Reza Shah. So you know, our mindset is yeah, either the British or the Americans. We don't go beyond that because. We don't read history. But I think people know because Reza Shah got, he got burned because of the, his association with the Germans. I mean, we, I think that anybody who's read, like you said, the history knows that that's one thing that Reza Shah got burned because of his association with Hitler and the Germans. And it's unfortunate that, I mean, it's all these foreign powers have interest in our country. We have national resources we have uh, you know there's so much for the persian gulf the caspian sea which now we don't have 50 something percent of it we have 11 percent of it but back then we had 50 at least percent of it everybody was interested in iran and unfortunately we are to be blamed as iranians for allowing these for even now even today i mean we allow these foreign powers to step in and decide for us and i know that to some extent it's inevitable that they're going to do that. We need their help in certain issues, but we have to learn. We cannot count on anybody but ourselves, but we haven't learned that yet. Even today, in our opposition, everybody's looking for funding. Everybody's waiting for somebody to fund them. When they've seen organizations like Derafsh, like a lot of other organizations who were funded, even these media right now, Manoto just got, off in January they're going to shut down their doors 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Iran International, they cut their staff by half, brought them to Washington. Now I don't know what's going on. They're moving back to London, apparently. But anything that's funded by the foreigners is going to be controlled by them. And it's going to be for their own benefit. It's not going to be for ours. But we still don't learn. When are we going to learn? We are a smart country. I mean, we're a smart bunch of people. Look what they did in Silicon Valley. Look all over the world. The best doctors, the best engineers. We have amazing brain that's leaving Iran, which is, unfortunately, this brain drain is terrible for Iran in the future. But we could have built our own country, and we could have st- stood on our own two feet, but we constantly wait for foreign powers to step in, and we're looking, still looking for foreign powers to come and rescue us. What's wrong with us? We have so much money outside. The diaspora could help, you know, the, this successful diaspora could help with, with freeing their own country. But no. Well, I think we have enough resources that we don't really need. I mean, Iran has enough resources that we don't really need the money from diaspora. I don't, I don't think we need money, but I do think whatever happens in Iran... And it, it has to start from within Iran. It has to be Iranian players. It has to be Iranians, the new generation there. But there has to be support from outside. There has to be some kind of a support. from. We saw that in the women's movement in Iran. Support, uh, yes, but control, no. no. Of course, you're not going to be able to control them. But even that, you know, you, you like the 2008 movement. I was very active in a radio station here. We're doing programs, and we saw the pressure in Iran. We saw millions of people come on the streets. And... You know, the airwaves were open, CNN, Fox, NBC, every day it was Iran, the demonstrations. And I remember all of a sudden President Obama came out and said, my hand is out here for Ahmadinejad to shake. And they shook hands and that was the start of the JCPOA and the people's movement went away. The same thing kind of happened with the women. never shook hands with... Well, it was my hand... They didn't shake hands directly, but U.S. their policies policies shaked hands. You know, the the JCPOA was a shaking of hands. That's why people were saying, Obama, are you with us or with them? Well, fast forward forward to the women's movement. We saw that, you know, we saw so much support here. Everything was there, you know, in the Oscars and everybody was wearing the scarves. And it went away again when, when, you know, the deal was made for the $6 billion and the hostages. And, you know, of course, we need Iranian oil. So there was negotiation, the start start of negotiations, which, which went nowhere. And our people, the opposition, we backed off. We quieted off, okay, because CNN is not playing any more videos of people dying. We forget uh, because Fox is not showing uh, videos of women getting beat up on the street. We stopped as an opposition. I think it, that's where we come in is to make sure that the lights, the camera, action is on Iran and we don't take the attention off. So I do believe we play a role. It's not to determine what the Iranian people decide, but we gotta make sure their voice is heard. But I think, Baba, I think don't undermine the, the Islamic Republic and how they, they have players in place from the White House to everywhere else to stop whatever. And if we fall in that trap, which we do, we fall into the trap of Nayak. A lot of times. Nayak's placed their players in key positions, which we haven't. The democratic opposition hasn't been able to do that. So they stopped a lot of it. They put us in they put a trap for us and we fall into the trap. That's the that's the problem that I've let, given let me up play on the devil's opposition. advocate with you with Nayak. Sure, they, they, they promote uh, open relations with Iran, commerce with Iran, normalization of the re- uh, relations with Iran. But on the other side, they perform a lot of services that there's no other orga- uh, Iranian organization like that's performing like it. Like what? They're there. They're there speaking. They're there talking on behalf of Iranians. They're there. Yeah, but he's at the JCPOA conference all the time with Zadi. Again, he, he, for, he, for, I'm not saying I agree with yeah. what they're saying, and I'm not saying that they're supported from from you know the one side or another. But where is where is the rest of us? That's what Wh- I'm where saying. Where are the monarchists? Yeah, exactly. Uh, where 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 are the the open democratic sides, the the national front? Where are they to fill in this void that's been filled with s- something else? Um, I you know I disagree with making or uh, yeah making Nayak this awful awful uh, you know agent of the Islamic Republic because I know. 
many of their members who are very much against the policies of the Islamic Republic. You know, we try, I don't know, Iranians, we either this person or this organization is horrible, an agent, you know, of course, everybody is branded. That's very, we are very good at that. We always brand people. I think that NIAC, when they started, they wanted to represent the Iranian American community in the US. And perhaps they had, you know, uh, the, the Islamic Republic behind them. I don't know. I'm not going to, you know, I without facts, without uh, documents, I cannot say that. But you know, you know who was actually on the board of NIAC? I mean, p please tell me that this is, you know, Nayak is, a, is an agent of the Islamic Republic. Uh, John Limbert, the ex, the ambassador John Limbert, the ex hostage was on the board of Nayak. Yeah, he but spoke. Limbert also sp is very close to a lot of the re reformists and everything. So, I mean, I mean, that, that's not a good enough reason. Nayak was founded by Zarif. And Amir Ahmadi, who hired Trita Parsi, says the whole story. And Hassan Adai, who took them to court and won, he gives you the whole history. Nayak is definitely the lobby for the regime. I mean, a lot of people have a hard time believing this. Let, let, let's, uh, even if we can't it substantiate that, yeah, let, let, me play the, the, let me play the devil's advocate with you. I'm not, I'm not implying they're, they're agents of the Islamic Republic. I've actually interviewed, on the, when I had my radio program, I interviewed uh, Trita Parsi and Hassan Adai. Who, who claimed he doesn't speak it, Farsi. It, it, was, it was a very interesting interview. But <laughs> forget, about, forget about who supports them or where they come from. For, for an organization claiming to represent Iranian Americans, and the biggest community of Iranian Americans in Los Angeles, when their president cannot come and give a speech in Los Angeles, because he's going to get heckled and he's going to get demonstrated by people like that. I think it's hard for them to claim that they're representing the whole community. They are representing a, a particular interest, uh, which is opening up negotiations between Iran and, and, and the U.S. And Not you know, Iran, Islamic Republic. Islamic yeah. Republic and the U.S. Uh, now, whatever way you see that, some people are for it, some people are against it. I'm not here to make a moral judgment on that. but. One of the things that, that's important is if you're representing the Iranian American community, you better have some support that you can go out to the people. And it's and I do agree with you. There's a lot of fine people in NIAC. There's a lot of educated people. We've actually spoken with Ambassador Limbert, and it, he's going to be uh, one of the interviews that people are, are going to be watching here. And I have talked to him about this, and I have talked to him in this interview about support for NIAC. So there's a lot of good people involved in that but as far as how popular they are in the u.s uh, both of you guys know that it's hard for them to come amongst the people but they've done a job well done they yeah. have people Aryan Tabatabai. they have people in the state department they have people in the white house they've placed their people they've done their job really well we have to say we have to give them credit for that let's let's <laughs> uh, let's change subjects a little bit it's a uh, just as sensitive of a subject. We uh, did an interview with Gary Sick. One of the things we talked about, and I think I know both of you guys have seen it, I've let Roxana see it, is one of the questions that uh, we get asked a lot, and I talk to a lot of people depending on which side of the aisle they're on, is the involvement of President Carter and the U.S. in ousting the Shah. And I know you guys are going to disagree on this. I, I want to hear both your opinions. And uh, we talked to Mr. Sick, and, and I think he gave a very eloquent answer. And I do believe he was he was telling me the truth. I do believe when, when listening to him, this is what 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 his his opinion was. From Roxon, having seen that, tell me tell me what do you think Carter's involvement was? What do you think the U.S. involvement was? Do you think they were they directly wanted the Shah out? Do you really think that? From all that I've read, um, you know, a lot of it points to them not wanting the Shah at, at, this, at that time, uh, but they didn't really support him either. And uh, we know now that, I mean, documents have come out that they've actually paid Khomeini, they, the Americans, towards the end when everything was falling apart. That's after the fact. After, yeah. not, not after the Shah left. Before the Shah left, they gave Khomeini money. But at the beginning, they didn't want the Shah to leave. What I don't believe that he had in his interview that I don't agree with him the Americans knew the Shah is sick. There's no way the Americans didn't know that the Shah is sick. 
I, I think everybody knew the Shah yeah. was sick. I think I mean, the French knew, the British knew. knew. Only the Iranian people yes. didn't know the Shah exactly. was sick. So that part, I don't agree with him. They knew the Shah was sick. They didn't stick up for the Shah. They didn't want him to go, but they didn't support him to but stay. But they actually wanted him to stay. The, the, the reports, even the CIA documents you see, is they wanted him to stay there. They wanted him to stay and, and put down these demonstrations. They wanted him to be that, that strong guy that, that they put in. The he Shaw didn't fill sick. that role. I mean, we, I mean we Carter went, wanted him to take action. I don't know if Carter even knew what he's doing. I really don't. But I mean, I know that when I came to the United States, when I opened the media, from morning to evening, all I heard was human rights abuses in Iran, the Shah being compared to Hitler, a dictator. The media was all over the Shah. So don't tell me they wanted to keep somebody like that. I came to the States before the Shah. Well, the media was tough on the Shah before, too. Yeah, but not like this. Not with his oil purchases, with his military purchases. Not comparing him to Hitler. And then, after the fact, when the revolution happened, from the get-go, when the stoning started, when the execution started, where was Mr. Carter and human rights then? All these years, with all the human rights abuses, not once has Carter spoken about human rights abuses of the Islamic Republic. I always question him. They've blocked me. I make a new email. I not not anymore. He's he's not when he was alive. Alive. He's really not alive anymore. He's. I mean, he's really sick now and not yeah, with it. But hospice. when he was, yeah, when he was okay and he was still running stuff and doing stuff, I used to send him emails every time there was an execution, and I say, Mr. Carter, where's your human rights today? And they would block that email. I make another one. Where has he been on human rights all these years? Where have they been on human rights all these years? What, go, what went on during the, what's going on in Iran for the past 45 years, nothing like this happened during the Shah's time. But they were all over the Shah. So don't tell me that they wanted to keep the Shah. Maybe they didn't want to overthrow him. The Shah was sick. And I think one of the flaws of the Shah was that he uh, didn't uh, have the, he, towards the end, I think he kind of gave up. He saw that people don't want him. He felt like people didn't want him. When he said, I heard the cries of your revolution, Re revolution, that was one of his biggest mistakes that he did. He admitted that there's a revolution going on, and he left. He left because he didn't want to kill his people more than what's going on now. But I think he should have stayed. I think that's one of his biggest mistakes. Even being sick, he should have stayed and not let everybody f fall apart like this. Things fall apart. I think if he would have stayed, it would have been different. And I, they didn't really want him to stay. They supported Khomeini towards the end. They funded him. Shaiba? Yeah, um, you know, my father always taught me, because he was a lawyer, that do not say anything without facts and documentation about anything or anyone. In the previous questions you posed to Roxanne, Roxanne said something to me that, or, you know, her answer, that these people uh, who are in Iran, who are ruling our country, are not Iranians. No, I'm sorry, they are Iranians. They are Iranians. They didn't come from Arab countries. They are from the same land that me and you came from. And yes, they're different because they came probably from the, 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 the villages of Iran who you know, at that time, we're not educated. Let's not forget, this is a fact. This is, this is a fact that during the Shah, the reign of uh, Muhammad Reza Shah, more mosques were built in Iran than sure. any other time in the history of Iran. Could I interject one second? And, and but, but what I meant was they're not Iranian at heart, not that they're not Iranian. Okay. Uh, okay. What I meant was if you're Iranian at heart, you can't do what you're doing to Iran today. You know, that's what I meant. I know they're Iranians, they, so they, obviously. They would say they that don't we care. are doing a lot for Iranians. So killing they, they, them? They claim, killing they, our kids? They claim, that, well, it's not black and white, as I said. Uh, no, of course, they, you know, whatever they have, they're doing, you know, it's horrible. And, uh, you know, we don't want this kind of regime to be uh, governing a, a, an old and civilized nation. However, we Iranians are very good, very good at always blaming the other. And that's actually what comes out in Gary Sig's interview, among other things. So t Carter, Jimmy Carter is the target. So let's look at that, that whole scenario at that time. 
Jimmy Carter is involved with bringing uh, Begin and Sadat together. For him, the Israeli-Arab conflict, it's the biggest, biggest issue of diplomacy during his presidency. And the Panama Canal. And the Panama Canal. Yes, he talks about that too. Uh, and and Gary Sick, you know, is, you know, in a way, in a funny way, uh, he says that Iranians and Iranian-Americans think that Iran is like the, the, you know, it's the universe for them. Yes, for them it is, but it's not for us. It's not for Jimmy Carter at that time. And demonstrations were taking place. And then, you know, his ambassador comes comes and goes. And he says, no, you know, the Shah, and the Shah says I'm in control. The Shah's people say that we're in control. And they weren't, they were lying. They were not in control. Mm -hmm. And yes, the Shah was sick. He couldn't make decisions. Alam was sick. Alam was the one who was, who, holding on who to was ho yeah who, he yeah. was the one who was made because we know from his character that also he was very indecisive he wasn't like his father mm -hmm. he was very indecisive throughout his reign uh and but Alam especially died. yeah that was a big especially during the last few years of his reign as you uh, very well portrayed in your film he you know when someone is sick do they want to leave the country with a legacy that I killed my people? He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to kill his own people. And he said that. Yes, and mm -hmm. he said that, yes. But in ca this, the, the, the fact that Khomeini was paid, this is nonsense. I'm sorry, Khomeini was not paid by anybody. Khomeini was in Iran. He was you know, sent or exiled to uh, 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 Iraq. And then from there, you know, he, he was sending messages to Iran for, I don't know, 20 years, whatever. And yeah, he was still popular in Iran. The Shah's government paid him a salary every month. L yeah. Let's talk well, about Ayatollah Khomeini. We don't know that. that. Yeah, we the, don't no, know no, that. The, they, they, we, the, they've said this. I mean, uh, but that's not the issue. What I meant paid, like Palestine supported him towards the, the end, you know. The Americans, the French supported Khomeini when he was in Nofle Chateau. Towards the end, the Americans also helped him. This all came out. Well, right? let, let, let's talk about they Ayatollah enhanced, Khomeini for a second here. They enhanced uh, his... his, his coming to power but it wasn't it wasn't that the, the French or the Americans it was the population in Iran the populace because let's not forget let's not forget let's really be realistic about our country let's not just talk about Tehran no, of course Shiraz Iran is and too. Isfahan we are talking about a country that is very religious that still you know even at that time was religious the Iran the Iranians Let's say that they knew uh, of Ayatollah Khomeini. But I've talked to a lot of people in the intelligence community, okay? People in the CIA, uh, Mr. Sick, Mr. Limbert, who was in, in Iran at the time of, you know, 1960s when the, the Khomeini the rose and, and he, he was exiled. He was in the Peace Corps. Yeah. And I talked to all these people who in 1979, uh, they came in support of Khomeini as a religious leader who was going to become just a religious leader and we're going to have a constitutional movement. You know, the whole, the whole spiel that was given to us at the beginning of the revolution. And I asked all these people, I said, well, you guys, you know, we didn't have internet then, but I'm sure the CIA and the NSA and all these agencies, they had Khomeini's book. They had his opposition to the white revolution. They had his opposition to women's rights. They had his opposition to uh, land reform. They had his opposition to basic freedoms and, and you know the, the modernity that was coming with, with the opening of society. And I asked all of them, I said, how come in 1979 there was not one mention of this is his beliefs, Velayat Fari. He had explained <laughs> the kind of government that he wants. He wrote a book about it. Yet nobody in the intelligence community had the wherewithal to come and say it. And this is one of those things that's just lost on me. I don't want to say that people are not telling me the truth, but just uh, you know, invoking ignorance of a, of a matter does not, does not brush it away. Mm -hmm. why, is there the, why is it that a lot of these people that were there were in Iran, they saw Khomeini, they saw what he stood for, they couldn't recollect his policies in 1979. 
I, I'm not putting this on you guys. Even like you have to even answer the for the media it. didn't do their job no. right. If somebody had read the Saleh Khomeini, his book, and talked had debates on the, uh, on the news, you think people would follow him? My roommate in college, I came home from school from class one night. She was laying down on bed reading this book and laughing. And I'm like, and she, as soon as I walked in, she says, Roxy, I picked up this book from your library, The Little Green Book of Khomeini, that had the highlights of his craziness uh, about having sex with your aunt if there was an earthquake, about camels, about all this stuff. She said, is this a joke book or is this actually what he wrote? So this is actually what he wrote. I'll tell you one thing. I, I spoke with uh, Professor Milani, and he said a very interesting point. He said that that could have been the Shah's fault, because if during his time there was open discussions about yeah, these I subjects, agree. the Iranian people I would agree. have been better educated. So you have should have done that. a censorship of everything, so you know this happens in a vacuum. Let me ask you guys your opinion yeah, and, on it. And, and and to, that is a very important point mm -hmm. that, unfortunately, during. Uh, the reign of the Shah, so many books were banned. And if 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 Rasale Aray Khomeini, you know, Hukumat Islami, <laughs> was published, you know, uh, and and you know people could read it, then they could see. But who knew? Who knew that he was going to become, you know, a, a, the leader but of a revolution? But towards the end, towards and the end, when he was, they should have read his books. On, on TV, a lot of Iranians didn't read. They weren't educated enough to read the books. And a lot of Iranians don't like to read. But they should have had discussions about this book. Who is this man who's sending you Shab Nometh, night, uh, whatever the, these letters that he was sending with a blanket and a chicken? My, na my nanny used to say that every time she would go for her day off, there was a new uh, letter from Khomeini that they were, was, was being distributed. So they were, they were spending money distributing his messages. They should have read those shabnames. They should have discussed what's going on. They didn't. This was a flaw. You know? Well, in Neufle Chateau, I think uh, when Khomeini went to Neufle Chateau uh, after Najaf, you know, no one, uh, or he, he said that when the revolution happens and the revolution is happening, uh, when the Shah leaves and I go back, I'm going to back, go to Rome and I'm just going to be an advisor. So basically he lied. He lied to everybody around him. Mm. He also never said that women have to wear the hijab Everything changed. He saw millions of people in the you know in the streets in his support, and he said, "This is it. You know, we 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 have to. Uh, you know, I have I have the power to do you know exactly what I wrote in my book 25 years, 30 years ago. So you know it. You know, this is what revolutions do. You know, in unfortunately, that's why we have to be careful that people who promise us stuff." Not necessarily when they come back to, to power are not going to keep those promises unless we have a constitution that's solid, that we're going to follow that constitution and we're going to make sure that constitution is going to be followed the way that we want it to be. Otherwise, we're going to be in the same mess over and over again. The 1979 revolution would not have happened if without the support of the intelligentsia and the intellectuals and the left. We've spoken to some people about that. What kind of a role do you think the left had at the beginning, not at not later stages of the revolution, but at the beginning of the revolution and ousting the Shah? And exactly what you said, not knowing what comes after. Do you think? Uh, do you think we've learned that lesson? Do you think that's why a lot of and by left, I'm not. I'm talking about you know social democrats, socialists, all the way to communists. Do you think? there's a lesson to be taken away from there and that's kind of causing a lot of people to be afraid of what comes next, what's the next revolution? Because of the support they give to the ouster of the Shah and what came after it, the disenchantment. I mean, we spoke with Mr. Salomatian, which uh, he kind of talked about that and the fact that, that that's, not what, that's not what they wanted. That's not what those women wanted who were demonstrating. We didn't know about the Khomeini's plans. What kind of trauma do you think that's caused the Iranian left in, in uh, being more hesitant to take action in whatever comes next? You mean today? Today. Yeah, I mean, um, unfortunately, I hear a lot these days uh, 
uh, that you know the f- they call them the fifty seven generation half term yeah. yeah yeah right and and of course we always blame you know blame the other uh, yeah intell- uh, the intellectual community in Iran or the the intelligentsia supported the revolution not necessarily Khomeini not at all mm. we you know I I, I mean I was raised in a a family that was nationalist, although me and all my brothers were leftists, and my father actually never liked that. But, uh, you know, it was the, the while the revolution or, or the events that led to the revolution were happening, was happening, uh, everyone, everyone from all walks of life, you know, from different um, ethnic minorities to, to, to you know, every you know, women, men, uh, yeah, we were all for the revolution because we 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 didn't like we or we didn't see that or we were I you know it's very hard for me to to put this in 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 into words, but uh, there was something we were missing. The something that was that we were missing was not that we didn't have. Uh, uh, basic uh, rights as uh, uh, you know uh, social rights uh, you know basic rights to dress the way we wanted to you know be you know without hijab or you know go to to I don't know discos or whatever you know western things Uh, but what we missed was uh, have the right to express ourselves politically you know have uh, discussions, be able to read, you know, whatever books that came out. All these w- were forbidden, and and unfortunately, unfortunately, the 1953 coup, the fact that a for- foreign powers brought the Shah back to Iran, left a terrible, terrible scar on his regime. If if that not had not happened, perhaps. Just as you said, if they had worked together, this revolution may not have mm-hmm. happened. I so, so we, we, you know, we did, we had, you know, basic rights, but we didn't have any political rights. We couldn't have parties. We couldn't have groups. Whereas, you know, after the revolution, I remember, uh, you know, I went back to Iran right after the revolution when the Mehrabad airport opened. Every corner in every uh you know, neighborhood in Tehran, people were standing, talking. We we went to demonstrations at Tehran University or other universities. You know, t- p- speakers were there from all sorts of you know, leftists, you know, uh, uh, nationalists. So there was an atmosphere where, for the first time, you could talk, you could express your opinion, you can you could write in different newspapers, dailies. So you know. So that's what the intellectuals wanted for Iran, and unfortunately, everyone, uh, you know, became disillusioned, and that's why you see that so many of these intellectuals ended up in exile. Someone like Ghulam Hossein Saadi, who was probably one of the best, uh, you know, writers, and and uh, you know, he he basically died from der uh, he, depression. He, from depression, absolutely, because he went with some other intellectuals to see Khomeini, and when he entered the room, he said, "Oh my God, what have we done? What did we do? Did we want this kind of, uh, uh, you know, these people to run our country?" So, you know, and, and today, I think it's a different mentality. I think that. The intellectuals in Iran are much more. The, the, the discourse in Iran is very different. It's so advanced. It's so advanced, and you have, you know, left-minded, moderate, even Islamic thinkers, who, they, you know, they they know what they want. I think they know what they want. They, they, uh, but they're not rushing to get that. They really want to have this process go. You know. Let's say tomorrow the Islamic Republic falls for you know with foreign ha- help or with you know from ir- from within, 
what's you know what's going to replace it let's talk about that mm-hmm. because if we don't talk about that today we're going to have the same the same problem that we had in 1974 the shah must go then you know who's con- who's going to come mm-hmm. who's going to replace it which kind of government do we want if we don't have these in our minds and in writing we're going to be in the probably worse mess than we are today so from your understanding since you went back to Iran and you've been back are they working together these different factions or each one is voicing their own opinion or are they uniting in in talking I, with each I other I think very much Roxanne because in the last time I went was 2019 and I traveled all over mm-hmm. I talked to many many people many people and we saw in in the Mahsa uprise or you know uprising I don't want to call it revolution because revolution has a, I don't a like specific me- uh-huh. meaning but we saw how united people were how everyone, you know, men, women, children, all came to the streets to voice their support of women, you know, and it's not just about hijab. Let me, you know, make it clear. It's not just about hijab. It's about social rights for women that they have not had, they have acquired a lot. They're, they're, you know, we have so many professors, so many women in many, many different fields uh, and and working, you know, in, in even not just in, Bi- you know, large uh, cities, but in provinces they're working. So I see that, uh, you know, my own take from my trips was that people are very much united and, and, and the people who, you know, who, who have the right or who can st- and still speak, you know, there's so many journals published in Iran. You know, we have a country that has has had one of the best civil society NGOs in the whole Middle East. Women have been running them. So so it's a, it's a country that even though it has been suppressed and oppressed, it's still very much vibrant, mm-hmm. very much vibrant. And I do believe, that's why I, I, you know, the first question that Bobak posed, I am very hopeful because I know that the discourse in Iran is far more advanced than than it is here. I have to agree because with Clubhouse, uh, I've seen this, but I've seen people who really supported this regime now are really turning against this regime now. I see that happening too. But the, there's a lot of conversation going back and forth between different mm-hmm. factions that uh, I myself wasn't even able to, to talk to them at the beginning two years ago when I joined Clubhouse to the people inside Iran. The, like the people who like Taj Zadeh who's in prison now. I mean, he was on Clubhouse constantly. But now we have dialogues. You know, Modarisi, who's, a, who's definitely with a part of the regime. I mean, I'm able to have dialogues even though I don't agree with anything he says. I don't trust him. But at least the dialogue has opened. This has happened even with us outside, with the people inside Iran. So I'm glad to hear, because that's very important. The, that practice, if it happens inside of Iran, it's the people who are fighting for that. It's not the regime that's going to allow it. They don't allow that. The journals, they let them go on for so long, and then they shut them down. The new Another ones open. one comes. Yeah, a new one opens up. So this is all good. This is all baby steps that we need to take to get there. But unfortunately, on the outside, I don't see that happening very, very much. How about Reza Pahlavi? I know, I know the history of the Shah and your support for him is unequivocal. How hopeful are you that Reza Pahlavi could be that that catalyst for change in Iran, could be a leader for the future of Iran as a monarchist? Okay, I'm going to say this, and I'm probably shooting myself on the foot today, but anyway, I'm used to it. I love Reza Pahlavi as a person. I mean, I I respect him for being in. He could have said, I don't want to have anything to do with this anymore. Look what they did to my dad and my grandfather. He could blame people and go away. He didn't. He stood and he's been vocal and he's been there, but there's a but to it. 45 years, Bobak, is a long time. In 45 years, we haven't been able to have a coalition of monarchists. Forget about everybody else. We haven't been able to have, we have a Hezbe Mashrute who's after 45 years, maximum members, 200 people. And nobody respects them, unfortunately. There's division amongst the monarchists. How do you expect him to be able to 
collect everybody and to be able to first of all what i'm working for is a parliamentary monarchy you know i want i want the monarch to just like you know um the constitution should say that if there is going to be a parliamentary um, you know if he's going to be a constitutionalist he should step away and be just a figurehead and let the parliament and everybody else do their job and be freely you know elected and democratically elected i don't see that happening with reza Farabi, unfortunately even though he he always says that he's with the Iranian people to the ballot box, the past few years, I don't see that in his camp. Well, he's he's very outspoken. Every time there's any, any kind of activity in Iran, he's the number one person that everybody goes to. But maybe you can respond to this. The ambiguity with which he represents his side, I think, I think it's, it, it, it leaves people with a lot of questions. Uh, myself, looking at the history of Iran, looking at the issues that uh, Dr. Mossadegh had with the Shah, which was that the Shah could uh, run the military, that the Shah could uh, run the judiciary, that the Shah could appoint prime ministers and, and fire them, what you said that it shouldn't happen. No, it should and I see Mr. Pahlavi, Reza Pahlavi, uh, when he talks about Iran, he talks about human rights, women's rights, secularism. religious freedom, secularism, which is great. I mean, that's the foundation that we have to build upon. Mm -hmm. But I have yet to see him define his role as a monarch. He says, whatever my people want. But shouldn't he explain what he has in his mind? Has, have you seen him explain these facts that what is his, his role as a constitutional monarch with respect to the military, with respect to the judiciary, with respect to hiring and firing prime ministers. Those are the three issues that, that we've had. I haven't seen clarification on that. I Do you think that, that would help? I think Prince Reza Pahlavi has to sit one day and be honest with himself. Does he really want this position? Does he really want to be I know he, he's a patriot. I know he loves Iran. I don't doubt that for a minute. I know he wants the freedom of Iran. But he's got a big big thing on his shoulder that he has to, he's got a big load that he has to be able to carry this load. First of all, he, everybody's looking at him, his supporters. And they're not, there are a lot of supporters. He's got to be honest with himself. Does he want this? I know he wants the freedom of Iran. But does he want to be a constitutional monarch in the future if people vote for him? Does he really want it? And if he does, like you said, he needs to come define that. And he needs to stand strong and say, I do. Uh, they, Pierce Morgan asked him, and he mm -hmm. didn't answer. He didn't answer. Mm -hmm. He goes around it. And Pierce says it's a yes-no situation, and he goes around it again. And Pierce Morgan says, well, I'll take it as a yes. He took it as a yes. I didn't. I still don't know. Are you going to accept it or not? Yes or no? But considering what happened to his father and grandfather, okay, uh, well, back. I, wouldn't, I also, wouldn't blame him for being reluctant. I know, I wouldn't either. <laughs> but when people are counting on you, you have the obligation, if you don't want it, to come and tell them, listen, I'm going to be with you till the day that Iran is free. I'll talk about you know the cause. I'll be your, you know, a spokesperson for you, but I'm not going to be the constitutional monarch. I'm not in that position. I don't want it. I don't that, want that for my family. I don't want what happened to me to happen to my family. He has to be honest with himself and with the people. You cannot keep everybody in limbo. Reza Fazeli, God bless his soul, he said one thing. He said Reza Pahlavi has become like a jet that's sitting on a runway. He won't move. He won't let anybody else go. And he won't go away. Unfortunately, after 45 years, as much as I love and respect him, I feel that Reza Fazili had a point, a very valid point. And today he needs to sit and be honest with himself. It's the future of all these generations who are fighting, giving their life up for the freedom of their country. You can't blame with their future. I appreciate you answering that difficult question. I'm going to put you in the hot seat now. <laughs> not, not so much. I, I've can I just say something about the question that you posed to Roxanne? Sure. I do not think that you can go back in history. I think monarchy fell in, in February 1979, and we cannot go back to that. And uh, I, I do agree with everything that you said, that you know he has to be honest with himself. I don't think he knows 
where he stands or he's not telling us. And as much as all the things that he says, very, na- very good words, mm-hmm. but it's not enough. Words are not enough. Yeah, and as you also said, you know, every once in a while there is an uprising, there is a movement, you know, in Iran, and he comes and then he goes and he's silent. So, you know, if you're working towards something for the future, you can't just, you know, come and then go and sit still and wait for the next episode. So, but in my opinion, monarchy is finished in Iran. We have, we've done, we've gone through that. Let me ask you a question. I've personally, I, a lot of my beliefs come from the left and I'm talking about the left in America, the political left here, you know, what, what, what it espouses, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom in politics, f- freedom for women, the basic rights that we have, that humans have. And as a youngster, I always gravitated towards the left because I, I saw that they were the ones that, that were fighting for these values. Yet, when it comes to Iran, and, and, I, and I do understand the point, but I just want you to kind of express it to me. How is it that intellectuals, politicians, academics, uh, who are freedom-loving, who are very liberal, who stand for these values of these freedoms, support a regime that, that, that is contrary to all these values, contrary to everything they stand for? I see people here uh, that don't go back to Iran uh, but they're on the far left, and they support, uh, you know, the negotiating with this regime, giving their money back, lifting sanctions, normalizing relations. Again, I'm I'm playing the devil's advocate here, but I've always I've always asked this of my friends: is uh, do you really know what it is that you're supporting? Because it may be contrary to your personal beliefs. I don't think anyone in the left, as far as I know, uh, and any. Uh, freedom-loving person, any liberal-minded person uh, wants a theocracy to continue in Iran. I don't think so. I don't think anyone supports it. At the same time, at the same time, I'm telling you from my own point of view, my own experience, I'm scared. To be honest with you, I'm terribly scared. That That's why I'm, I'm, I'm not for sanctions at all. I'm, I'm for negotiation, I think that change has to come slowly, not all of a sudden, because I am afraid for the future of Iran. I don't know what's going to happen. Is it going to be uh, a Syria and Iraq? You know, where look, look at Iraq. Look, look, look the situation. And why do the American different, you know, uh, governments, except maybe for Trump? Why are they negotiating? Because, you know, they, I mean, look at the Middle East. <laughs> it's, it's not the Middle East, it's Middle East. It's They've in, modeled it's in, it, though. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, <laughs> they, and, and the governments of those countries, too, sure. you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, they could have given freedom. Bashar Assad could have had given some freedom to his, I mean, forget about Saddam. Saddam was a ruthless, you know. I'm surprised tyrant. that Bashar Assad, being a young generation, to to do what he's continuing worse than what his father did, unfortunately. Uh, but the left, uh, I don't know where who you're referring to as the left. I don't think any, you know, any anyone who's for for because the left, in my opinion, the real ele- a real left is is for social justice, really for social justice. And you can't be supporting a, re, a, a regime that suppresses and tortures and executes uh, people right and left without any, you know, without even, uh, you know, coming up with excuses, you know, why we have executed or, or not even have reason that why they're executing, they have executed people or torturing people. So I don't think that. I know of any really any leftist that supports this let me, regime. Let, 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 Mama, me, let can me follow I say up. On, hold on. Let me follow up on that. You mentioned something that that it's that fear of of, of chaos, of destruction of Iran. I, I understand that, but at the same time, normalizing relations, 
lifting sanctions, giving money to uh, the a regime like that. I just want to know in your opinion, and you said it takes time. It, it, it doesn't happen right away. Do you think if, if President Trump wouldn't have come and, and uh, backed out of the JCPOA, do you think if, if, if we went forward with, with, with that time frame and the more sanctions were lifted, more money was given, and you know President Trump wouldn't have, wouldn't have backed out of that deal? Do you think that would have changed Iran? Do you think that would have changed this regime or caused change within the regime uh, or moderated the regime? Do you think that if we would have just thrown money at them and, and uh, let everything go, uh, they, they, they would have normalized? Because what we saw with that money that went to, to Iran, uh, and we talked to Professor Hokard, and he, he very, very eloquently talked about this, and I said, uh, well, that money went to Syria, that went, money went to Yemen, that many w money went to Lebanon and, and Gaza uh, and, and Iraq. And he said, yes, we should have put more. We should have given more and more and more money, and eventually it would have been enough uh, for, for the Iranian middle class to build up, and that would have changed things. Uh, that's that's the nature of that argument, which is saying lifting sanctions. This is what we're trying to do. Do you think that would have worked with the Iranian regime, uh, knowing where the money went? You know, the sanctions has the sanctions have hurt the Iranian people. In my opinion, uh, it hasn't hurt the regime at all. They've been able to go around the sanctions. The sanctions have have. Uh, hurt the ordinary Iranians in Iran. I talk to a lot of people, a lot of relatives, other people who live in Iran. So th I, I think the whole sanction regime was wrong, just like the sanction re regime in Iraq was wrong. Sanctions have never really worked. And yes, I mean, Trump, whatever he did, uh, getting out of the, the, the uh, JCPOA and all that, I also think that was wrong because, yes, there was movement because I could tell. I went to Iran uh, when, I, when I arrived in Vienna. Uh, it was between Rouhani and Raisi who was going to be president. And I told my, my husband, if Raisi is, is uh, elected, I'm going to ba go back to Washington. But then Rouhani was elected, so I went to Iran. And Yes, things were moving a little bit, little bit by little bit. And I'm not saying that, you know, this person or that person is that much different, but there is a big difference. There is a big difference between Rouhani and Raisi. There is a big difference, or there, there was at that time. And we see that, yes, there are elements within the Iranian regime who are, who want to good, you know, who want positive changes for their country. You know, we see them even becoming more in the opposition to this current government because this current government is the ultimate, uh, you know, I don't like to use the word evil, but, uh, you know, I'm sorry, if you have an executioner as your president, then this is just the, the worst of the worst. So I, my humble opinion is that there is a big difference between Rouhani and Raisi. And I saw that with my own eyes. Even in 2017, when I was there, and in 2019, this is before Mahsa movement, I saw women, girls without hijab, in front of Tehran University, without hijab. So things were moving. And I, when I say th things were moving, no, not quickly, not as quickly as we want, but things were getting a little bit better and then they pulled out so you know what what are you going to do or what is what is our role except to say okay you know we want the downfall of this regime not not tomorrow but yesterday but what is next i'm 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 scared of that next is it going to be chaos do we have a plan do we have a program i don't know that's what we're talking about right now Let's talk about something that it's, it's, this is just as divisive, is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, we have loved ones on both sides. It's tragic. Why are Iranian people so involved in this? Do we even have a horse in this race? Uh, what's going on with Iran? Do you think this is a deflection? 
which is not taken away from the atrocities being committed on both sides. It is a war. It, it is a war. Let's not, let's not forget it. Uh, but why do Iranians take sides on this? And tell me your perspective side on it. I'll start with Roxana. Well, as far as I'm concerned, like you said, it's a war and it's a shame that, you know, both sides are losing lives and it, that's what happens in wars, unfortunately. Uh, the thing that really, really scared me this time, uh, I mean, they've been at conflict for a long time. The barbaric way that on October 7th, this whole situation started. I mean, it wasn't like bombing somewhere. It wasn't like just, you know, taking few hostages. The way that they kidnapped, they killed people, they went into the houses, they raped girls. They, I mean, everything about it was barbaric and it, sh it really shook me up. It took me back to stories we read about like during the God knows how many years ago. And that's what scares me. And that's what scares me about Islamic fundamentalism. And for the past 40 years, 30 something years, I've watched this fundamentalism grow all over, all over the Middle East. If since the inception of the revolution, Khomeini promised that he's gonna export his revolution. He's done it. And unfortunately, everywhere's kind of kept quiet about everything that's happening. And we see it today. We see it in the universities. We see it on the streets. We see that everywhere we're seeing this Islamic fundamentalism mushrooming and mushrooming and spreading. And this is dangerous. This is a very dangerous situation for the future. And that scares me. And I don't know, this is going to, I really hope it doesn't get very bad, but I have a feeling it's going to get really bad before it starts getting any better. I mean, as far as Israel, I know they've been at each other's throats for the past whatever many years, but they've never gone and done something like this to the Palestinians. Not, and it's not the, you know, it's Hamas. It's they're trained, funded, sponsored everything by the Islamic Republic. So, I mean, the head of the snake is really the Islamic Republic, but it's spreading all over. Look at what happened 9-11. This scares me that in our universities in Harvard, in UCLA, Berkeley, Columbia, that we're having this kind of Hamas supporters coming out and demonstrating in favor of Hamas, not in, in favor of Palestinians, in favor of Hamas. That's what scares me. You can understand uh, people in the Islamic world, and, and I do agree with you in, in the atrocities that were committed in, in the horrid way that attack started. But it, it's just as violent going the other way right now. I mean, both ways is hard, Babak, but the, maybe I'm more harsh because I feel the threat of this Islamic fundamentalism growing throughout the world. And in a world where we're moving forward, Unfortunately, this is moving. Even the women, I ask some of these girls, young girls with the hijab, I'm like, why? What is the difference between your hair? Kids going to Berkeley, UCLA, all these kids. What is the difference between my hair and your hair? Why do you believe that you have to, you're, in, you're smart, intelligent people. Why do you as a girl think you have to cover up more than your brother or your father? What's in today's world? You're fighting for equality. You want to work like your brother does. You want to study like everybody else. You want to go to Harvard. What is the difference? So some this of them, is, it's a personal choice. If they're not being forced yeah, into but it, you know I think what? everybody's allowed to I know. I, do, everybody's, do what they believe. Yeah, but unless you start, this starts harming other people and you're going to start preaching it to other people, mm -hmm. then that's going to be the danger. If it's your personal choice, it's your personal choice. In Iran that I was growing up in, People ha were free. They would wear head chador. Somebody would. I never cared to wear a chador or a head job or something. You know, my family didn't. My grandmothers did. Like one of my grandmothers wore a scarf. We all have. We all yeah. have family members no, who wore that. Veil and as chador. long as you're not forcing that, and b this kind of blind uh, following of this is Islamic ways. As long as you're not promoting that, I have no problem with it. But unfortunately, they're promoting this. 
So you think that's the bigger question there in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Is a spread of fundamental Islam? Well, the way they, that they're going about it, I understand the question of the land and the fighting that they've been having for all these years, which one of my Palestinian friends told me one day. Very, I really admired him for that. He said, you know, we're never going to get this land back. It's a reality. It's like the Persian Empire. So much of our Persian Empire was taken back. We're going to go get it back. He's like, let's develop our country. Look what they did on the other side. Look at their army. Look at their education system. Look at everything that they're doing. And we are still fighting with stones and rocks and digging tunnels to be able to get our land back. Let's develop. Let's move on. Maybe by that, by educating ourselves, maybe we can get strong enough so that we can do, make a difference and have a two-state two solution back then. Until we're fighting, and this is a Palestinian saying this, until we're fighting, we're not going to have that two-state solution. And I really admired him for that. But that, there's not too many like him. Fireball, I know you have a differing opinion. Explain to us where you stand on this. I have very strong opinions. In fact, <laughs> I argue. I've I've read your recent work, and I know you write a lot about this. That's why I wanted to. I have written. See, see I have written w- yeah. even before that about two Jewish friends of mine that I met at a conference, and I wrote a whole um, article about that long time ago. But I think, as human beings, and if we believe in social justice and the right of people to have self determination. We cannot be ignorant to what has happened uh, with the uh, with the uh, Israeli Arab uh, with the Israeli Arab conflict, and this conflict didn't start on October seventh. On October seventh, a horrific slaughter happened. I'm not sure about the rape because we don't know the details yet. We don't know the details. We just he- hear here and there women were raped. I'm not sure about that. Well, we saw them parading naked women through the streets screaming. So No, there, was, were, a t- there was a tape that th- this guy was saying, keep her, she's good for raping. We put this one on the bus, but yeah, keep we, her. We right. s- I mean, we've well, seen But those. regardless, atrocities, gets, gets right. atrocities yeah. Yeah. Were, were. But it's very interesting that most of the people who have come out uh, uh, in since October 7th, uh, whether... Uh, in uh, Penn Station, New York City, whether at the Liberty uh, in New York, uh, the Statue of Liberty, they're all Jewish, Jew- Jewish uh, Americans or pro uh, Jewish, pro Palestinians, and they said not in our name. Why do they say not in our name? Because what's happening today? Uh, 200 and they said 230 some people were hi- uh, were um, take taken as hostages. hostages. Uh, now the number has come down to 1,100 people were killed, were massacred during uh, on on October 7th. 11,000 Palestinians have been murdered by bombs. 5,000 children, children have been killed with, uh, with the most sophisticated bombs that you and I and other people in this country, taxpayers, are giving to the Israeli government to do this. Let's go back in history. Let's read history because we don't do that enough. 1948, in the village of Deir Yassin, this is fact, this is there, it's, you can read it. You can watch it on YouTube. Irgun, which became IDF, went to the village of Der Yassin. They murdered, they threw the Arab, the Palestinian population. They took over their houses. They burned. There's a Palestinian, he was a young man at that time. He saw with his own eyes that the, the Ergun soldier told the father, put, the, uh, put your son into that fire. And he said, I won't do that. The IDF, the, the Ergun fighter, I call them terrorists because they also bombed the King David Hotel. Let's read history. No, no, no. And then what did he I know, do? Let, let's, they, let's take they this pushed, to another level. They pushed 
the the father Look, and the son into the we, fire. We can talk about atrocities that have been committed there for thousands of years, both sides. No. What I'm talking about is, is 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 today, and what I was talking about is is why, as Iranians, we've put this issue. And again, I'm not saying I disagree with you. Okay, I'm just saying there's no point in arguing which side is more violent, which side this side killed 1,300, this guy ki this side killed 11,000. What's the what's the correct response? How should have Israel responded to that? There's a lot of there's a lot of talks we can have. I want to avoid that. The question I want to ask I, I is as to answer but to I want to ask as Iranians said. Iranians uh, as an Iranian as an Iranian why is this so important to us and why have we taken sides with the Palestinians or the Israelis I just want to know your opinion of why you're siding with the Palestinians and and I and I have complete uh, respect for your opinion as I have c no, respect for I your opinion I, no, I just no, want to know I, why I as Iranians uh, she explained why her opinion is I want to say you, as, as an Iranian, why is it that, that your support falls on this side? Why is it that your allegiance leans more towards that way? I really didn't want to get into the argument or who's right or wrong. I want to see why you stand on that side. The whole world, the whole world is, is saying who's right and who's wrong. The whole world, since, since the longest occupation of modern history, longest occupation in modern history, the whole world is telling Again, let, telling let, us and and i, wh I why didn't we you, say anything about Az uh, when in azerbaijan and armenia a hundred thousand people died why is it that the iranians didn't care about that why is it that the iranians didn't care where thousands of chechens were being slaughtered by the russians we didn't hear any word about it i'm just trying to say why is it as iranians this particular uh, conflict is so important to us as opposed to other conflicts in other places. It is not true. I mean, I, if you ask me personally, I have written about many other things. I've written about the Congo. I've written about, uh, you know, Guatemala. I've written about all these other countries. Yeah. I haven't written about Chechnya. I haven't writ written necessarily about Russians. But these are but these are events that have but happened but recently. But that that but yeah. as a country, I'm saying I'm not just talking about you. I'm talking about Iranians. Iran, the Islamic Republic, why is their focus so much on these is, uh, Muslims and uh, not the Muslims in China or other Muslims that are being uh, killed in large numbers? That's uh, true. Why is this conflict so important to us? Well, uh, I think the, the Islamic Republic, since its inception, uh, they, they believe that, uh, you know, Jerusalem or Quds is you know, it's the ultimate goal for Muslims that they have to go and conquer that. That's their ideological belief. And they don't, ac they don't accept the state of Israel. But uh, Iranians, actually, I think I Iranians... I mean, why Israel? There's so many other atrocities committed against Muslims that they could champion. Why is it this particular Because place? Israel has taken the land and, s and, and has let, you know, settle, you know, something that Roxanne said, that these are Muslim fundamentalists, and you know, I I don't I d don't like them, I despise them, whatever. Uh, this Hamas, you know, they're terrorists and all. Great, you know, we I I think that they're also, you know, what they did on October seventh and before that, they, they've they've engaged in terroristic, you know, uh, activities. But, you know, <laughs> this is why I I you know I believe that. All of us should read more and more and more because if you don't read, you don't, you don't, you know, you don't look at the facts from all sides. Why is it that 960 Palestinians were thrown out of their homes by settlers in West in the West Bank when the West Bank and Mahmoud Abbas has accepted the the, the reality of Israel and the the fact that Israel is a country? Why is it that they're they're still you know, the IDF goes there instead of being there near the border with Gaza, protecting those peace loving. They were actually peace loving Israelis in, in the kibbutzim that they killed, the, the Hamas killed. Why weren't they there at that time? And so, you know, I don't agree with this, that, you know, th these people are all, you know, they, they, they want uh, you know, they want the, the uh, eradication of the state of Israel and that, you know, look at look at the West Bank. What are they doing there, the settlers? Why is the Israeli government under Netanyahu, who's going to be 
probably hopefully fall after this war uh, why what why are they doing what they're doing in the west bank the west bank has accepted the 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 state of israel and the iranians yes the islamic republic has an affinity with this movement and they they support it they don't support the palestinian authority they support hamas because hamas is has the same I- ideology just like hezbollah does but at the same time have you seen any demonstrations in iran in support of nothing even because, in the stadium, they, they brought the against, flag out. Be, people yeah. were Bec- chanting against be, it. Because because Iranians have had enough of this, you know, support for this and that. When they see that their own country, they yeah. they need the money. They need to have schools. They need to have hospitals. But that's it. That is another thing. Yeah, the Islamic Republic wants to export its, you know, money elsewhere to have more regional power. I mean, we're you know, it's all all about the regional power and everybody's exercising that and i agree that both sides i i you know palestinians are you know if we believe in human rights which i do they have every right they have to work towards the two state solution there's no other way they some they have to finally sit down and work something out this can't continue like this but to allow hamas to if the israeli sit quiet that's why i'm taking israel's side now if Israelis stay quiet after what happened on October 7th, this is going to continue there on a regular basis. And Hamas will not stop. Hamas was on the streets of Tehran killing our kids this last massive struggle. Because a lot of Iranians didn't want to go out there and fight their own people. There was a lot of Hamas people out on the streets. People in Iran were telling me. Now... How do you know they were Hamas? They said they were, the, uh, they were Arab, you know, the forces, they were speaking Arabic on the street. The first couple of days, everybody on Clubhouse who came and reported, they were saying a lot of these people are speaking Arabic. They're not even speaking Farsi when they're yelling at each other and everything. So Hamas, Hezbollah, whatever, it was their proxies of the Islamic Republic. It was Arab forces. Now, Arafat supported the Ayatollah Khomeini when Khomeini came to power. But what happened during the war? What happened during the Iraq, uh, Iran-Iraq war? They went for Saddam. They supported Saddam, right? So the, my problem is, why are we rallying for everywhere else? We have a lot of problems ourselves. Like Fariba said, we don't have schools. We don't have hospitals. What are we doing going, spending this money elsewhere, building great schools and great hospitals when we need them? It's our money. But because of their proxies, they'd like to hold on to their proxies. They spend all our money on those proxies, unfortunately. I appreciate both of you guys being here, talking to each other. Uh, we've gone uh, almost twice as long as we expected to. And I, and I do appreciate this conversation. I think it's very important, uh, the two sides that you represent and the discussions we had and the common ground that I think I saw between you here. I think this is something to build on. I'm going to finish with one question, which involved something that you both talked about is, is we're afraid of getting into something that we don't know what comes. And uh, true, there's there's no cohesion, there's no there's no unity for us to come together and represent our views. But let's say you were you were to put together uh, a future for Iran. Let's say you were put together you were to put together a future plan for Iran. What would it be? I'd like to hear yours. I'd like to hear yours. You tell me yours first. You're personal. Now, I understand this This is not something you're imposing on people, but it, after 40-some-odd years of fighting and battling, what is it that you want? What is it that you're looking for for a future in Iran? Um, <laughs> it's hard to, you know, put it in words or... But I think we need to put it in words. Yeah, we need to start putting in words that you have and comparing really, our beliefs yeah, with each other. Yeah, but that's something that you really need to uh, um, think, you know, for a long time and you know. You haven't thought it, about it yet. Put it in writing. <laughs> no, because I'm not in that position. Let's I'm say not, you were you supposed know, to gener- generalize. What type of government do you think would benefit Iran in the future? I believe in a in a secular democracy. I also believe that. In fact, uh, if, you know, we have elections, uh, you know, have free elections monitored maybe by outside forces, the United Nations or other countries, 
um, so there are no, there is no, um, you know, um, uh, you know, the elections are fair, uh, and people from different parties and different organizations have their own uh, representative, not, you know, not determined by one person, mm -hmm. which has been the case with uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, Hokme Hukumati, as he call it, as he calls it. Um, free elections and you know people from different walks of life from different minorities ethnic minorities religious minorities can have representation uh, and um, you know I, I believe in a, in a secular democracy I don't think we can go back to monarchy do you believe any kind of a symbolic role for a monarch I it hasn't worked it hasn't worked in Iran it may work in European countries. It hasn't worked, and I don't believe that it can work. And I think we've we've done we've gone through that. It's we're done with that. Uh, so I I I I think if you know first free elections and then have good representation from different you know people who who are in Iran who are at the for have been at the forefront of this you know. Uh, movements different movements and um personally uh i think someone like you know i mean of course it's it depends on the vote of the people but someone like nargis muhammadi can become the next president of iran voted by you know in in free elections of course you know that's my wish but uh there are many there are many people who have the potential to be leaders in Iran, mm -hmm. who have lived in Iran, who, are in gone, now. who yeah. have gone through imprisonment, who have been outspoken. So, so free, you know, free and democratic elections. Roxa, thank you. Well, m uh, my goal has always also been a secular democracy. I believe in a, a strong constitution has to, you know, be written and you know, being voted on. I believe that the parties should be able to form before we vote on what form of government or whatever we want. The parties should freely be able to advertise and the media should support them, let them talk. They should come forward and give the people of Iran a chance to hear their side, what they're going to be doing for rebuilding. Rebuilding Iran is going to take a long time and it's going to take a lot of dedication. And I hope that we all realize if we really, really love our country, that we have to put our differences aside for, for a while and be able to, even in the future, we have to be able to, okay, we have our parties, we have different opinions, we can agree on certain issues and we have to agree on those issues and move on and build our country. I hope Iranians learn that we have to respect each other's you know, ideology, even if they differ from us, if it doesn't damage the future of our country if it's in the you know process of rebuilding Iran and if it's in the right path for Iran. And I hope that we learn to, to work together because uh, we're going to need that in the future of Iran. And I really think that it's going to happen from inside of Iran. As much as we're all Iranians, and I mean, I had no fault uh, that I had to live most of my life outside of Iran. My heart beats for Iran every day. But those people who suffered who, like Fariba said, were, were in prison, who've lived in Iran, who've gone through all the difficulties. We've gone through difficulties of exile, but it's nothing like living under the Islamic Republic. Nothing. We've had comforts of our living abroad in a democratic world and, you know, choosing what, how we want to live our life. So we have to have to respect those inside of Iran. They, they are the forces that need to make that decision. I mean, we're as much Iranian as they are. We, we have the right to vote, but they really went through a lot, and they really need to decide what they want for the future of Iran because they probably know better than we do. Fariba Amini, Roxana Ganji, we appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you for being with Thank us. You. Nice meeting you, Fariba. Thank you. Thank you.